Uh, Mr. President, in the city of Chicago, which I'm proud to represent, there's an organization called Lifespan. This is an incredible group of people who dedicate their lives to providing comprehensive services for the survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Every day they respond to horrifying cases of abuse. They help thousands of women and children access the support they need to address trauma and to rebuild their lives. For example, Lifespan recently assisted a woman after her teenage daughter was sexually assaulted by the woman's husband. Lifespan was able to help the mother and daughter navigate the overwhelming challenges of pursuing justice against the abuser and offer support to the daughter throughout this horrible process. When the mother pursued a divorce from the abuser, Lifespan filed a petition and is representing the mother as she navigates issues of child support and allocation of custody. The three Lifespan staffers that the mother and daughter have interacted with all provided critical bilingual and bicultural support. They have provided this crucial service for this family during an incredibly traumatic experience. And all three of these staffers are funded by assistance provided through the Victims of Crime Act, or VOCA. Lifespan told me that without VOCA funding, quote, none of these personnel would be able to have done this job. Congress passed the Victims of Crime Act in 1984 to establish the Crime Victims Fund. This fund provides grants to state victim compensation and assistance programs which assist victims with expenses like medical bills, funeral expenses, and the loss of wages during recovery. How often I have heard members of Congress come to the floor and in committee speak about the plight of the victims of crime. This is an effort, an overt effort by Congress to make sure we are there when they desperately need us. The fund also supplies grants to thousands of victim service providers like Lifespan across America. These providers offer programs serving victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, trafficking, and drunk driving. The Crime Victims Fund doesn't receive a dime of taxpayers' dollars. How about that? It is funded through criminal fines, penalties, forfeited bail bonds, and special assessments collected by the federal government. Historically, most of the money in the fund comes from those criminal fines. But in recent years, deposits into the fund have dropped significantly as the Justice Department began relying more on deferred prosecution and non-prosecution agreements. Monetary penalties from these deferred prosecutions and non-prosecution agreements are currently deposited into the general treasury instead of this fund. And as a result, this shift has had a devastating impact on the fund and the services available to crime victims in America. That's why a bipartisan, bicameral coalition of members of Congress worked with the advocacy organizations on a fix to the VOCA law to sustain the Crime Victims Fund. Our bill would stabilize the depleted fund by redirecting monetary penalties from deferred prosecutions and non-prosecution agreements to the victims and service providers that desperately need help. The, reduce, the reduced deposits into the fund have already had a devastating impact. Victim assistance grants have been reduced by more than $600 million in 2021, and more cuts are looming if we don't do something. The executive director of Lifespan in Chicago told me that VOCA funds 44% of the agency's services, about $1.6 million annually. A substantial loss in VOCA funds would mean they would have to cut back staff who provide counseling, criminal court advocacy programs, legal services, affecting an estimated 880 clients. Lifespan is not alone. Advocates across the state of Illinois and across the country have reached out and shared what these cuts would mean for their agencies and the victims they serve. The Center for Prevention of Abuse in Peoria, Illinois, quoted, noted, I quote, we never want to be in a position where we have to turn away people who need our services and dedicated care. Our teams are already stretched thin as they, as they live the promise of our mission day in and day out. Fewer VOCA dollars means fewer staff and a lessened ability to help those who need to find safety, food, shelter, empowerment, freedom, and peace. There's no time to waste. Every day that goes by, we miss an opportunity to help replenish this fund. 
In 2021, the fund has already missed out on approximately $400 million in deposits. We're not even halfway through the year. Imagine how much more money the fund may lose if we don't do something. That's why it's imperative that the Senate immediately pass this bill. The House already did it in March with broad bipartisan support. And here in the Senate, we have a bipartisan coalition of 56 senators, 36 Democrats, and 20 Republicans co-sponsoring legislation. We could send this bill to the president's desk today. We should have sent it to him weeks ago. Unfortunately, there's an objection that has prevented us. In a recent letter to Leader Schumer, victims' rights and law enforcement organizations said the objectors are, in effect, holding victim services hostage in an ideological quest to overhaul the appropriations process by eliminating budgetary offsets. What a target to choose if you want to change the procedure of the committee. Crime victims? I agree with the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and so many other groups, more than 1,700, that are begging us to do something and stop holding this critical legislation. The passage of this legislation today would ensure that victims are able to maintain these critical services. Don't we owe it to them after the promise of help to come through? At this point, I'd like to turn to my colleague, Senator Murkowski, and I ask unanimous consent that Senator Murkowski, Toomey, and I be able to complete our remarks part of the votes. Without objection. I'm disappointed that the senator from Pennsylvania is adamant in his position, even though we are dealing with victims of crime, victims of domestic violence, and victims of child abuse. Like Illinois, Pennsylvania has experienced nearly 70 percent cut in VOCA funding since 2018, and more cuts are on the horizon because of his strategy. Here's what it boils down to. If you listen carefully to what the senator from Pennsylvania has said, he is not suggesting that the money is being spent for other purposes, but suggesting it could be. In fact, there is a conscious effort by the Appropriations Subcommittee to make sure that if all the money is not spent in one year, enough is maintained to stabilize the fund for future years. That's thoughtful. That's what we'd like to hear. But we're at a desperate moment now where we need the money and need it at this moment. I understand my colleague's concern about scorekeeping in the budget. It's an important issue, even though it's esoteric. But to do it in relation to the Crimes Victim Fund seems entirely misplaced. While this adjustment does not, in fact, transfer money from the fund to other priorities, it is just a budgeting gimmick that he's suggesting. This isn't the right place or time to do this, when thousands of people across the United States are in desperate need of shelter, to get out of an abusive home, of help for their children who have witnessed murders, of dealing with the court proceedings that may be unintelligible to the average person to try to protect their families and themselves. To think that we are engaged in this high-level budget debate at this moment at their expense is just not right. I urge my colleague to withdraw his amendment and allow the legislation to proceed. We can debate the budget with the budget resolution and the appropriations process, but not at the expense of crime victims across America. If he will not withdraw his amendment, I must object.